Well, I was asked to come up here uh, to talk about the future of food. And uh, if I was you, sitting where you're sitting right now, I would be skeptical. Because I don't trust people who say they can predict the future. Because usually, you know, history, experience, fable, myth, teaches us that people who say they can predict the future are one of two things, either wizards or fools. And I'll say that I'm definitely not the former, and you'll be the judge tonight whether or not I'm the latter. <laughs> so what am I? If I had to categorize myself, I would say that I'm a pattern seeker. I've spent my entire career basically taking my passions of food science, culinary arts, and anthropology, and using those to see patterns, to understand why people behave the way they do, why they think the way they think, and why they eat the way they eat. Why are patterns so important to see the future? Because the future has so much possibility to it. I mean, just think about it. 50 years ago, people said, within 50 years, everyone's just going to be eating pills. There's going to be no food. Of course, that didn't happen, right? Why didn't it happen? Because the motivation was never there. We want food, right? So if you understand the motivation, you can see how it plays out in history. And I think you can be able to see that pattern and how it can actually go into the future. Now, one thing that a lot of people think is, well, you know, the motivations that drove our ancestors three, 400 years ago, those aren't the same motivations that we have today. And I'll tell you, that's not true. The motivations that they had are, I would say, exactly the same as those of you sitting here. And so I think we can use those motivations, finding those motivations, finding those patterns in order to see further into the future. Well, that's a lot of talk. I want to give you an example uh, to kind of show you what I mean. Let's look at the past in order to possibly see the future. 1701, a great war broke out in Europe. And for our purposes here, all you need to know is that on one side was England, Spain, and Portugal. And on the other side was France, the Dutch Republic, uh, the Holy Roman Empire, a bunch of people. Now, for the English aristocracy, this was a great war. They never really liked the French. They were fine with, you know, being mad at the French. But for the English common people, they were kind of upset. Why were they upset? No wine. They were like, oh my gosh, we're at war with the French. We have no wine. So they said, what are we going to do? So they said, wait a minute. We're new, we have new friends. We have Spain and Portugal. Don't they make wine? So they talked to their new friends. And the Portuguese said, yeah, we make, we make this thing called port. It's very traditional. We make it very traditionally. We'll make it for you. By the end of the 17th century, the Portuguese were exporting 25 million gallons of port to England. It's a lot of port, right? Now, when the Portuguese said, we make it traditionally, they weren't kidding. Because one of the key ways to make port, there's a step where they clarify it. It's very important to port, to clarify it, to make it be clear. And uh, the traditional way to do that is to use egg whites. Okay, so they would actually pour egg whites into the vats of wine and then remove the egg whites and it would make a crystal clear port. Now, 25 million gallons of port, though, that's a lot of egg whites, isn't it? But more importantly, that's a lot of egg yolks. What do you do with all those egg yolks? Well, being a good Catholic country, the Portuguese could think of only one thing to do. They gave it to the nuns. Okay? So the nuns had 25 million gallons of port worth of egg yolks. Okay? Now, what did they do with that? Well, the nuns, being very frugal, and nuns at this time lived in convents, but convents weren't the cloistered things that we think of today. They were connected to restaurants and hotels. So the nuns baked them into pastries, not just any kind of pastry. They used a lot of egg yolks. Some recipes from this time actually call for one cake, 60 egg yolks. Yeah. And so you see this culture of egg yolk rich pastries developing. And what's interesting about that is if you go to any country that was touched by Spain or Portugal today, you see these egg yolk rich pastries. If you've been to Sao Paulo or Oaxaca, you've seen these type of things. You see this egg yolk rich pastry. Now, that is a good history lesson, but that's not what I'm here to talk about. 
I'm interested in saying, what happens if you were around when those nuns were first making those pastries? Would you be able to say, I think that's going to be a trend that is going to continue for the next 300 years? And that's something that I find fascinating. And I think that if you could have seen a pattern, yes, you could have. And the pattern I think that you would have been able to see is that I think that the nuns caught on to something. They didn't even know they were doing it, but they caught on to something sticky. That, I mean, that pun intended. Sticky. And that sticky thing was a cultural motivation that existed within Western culture uh, for the color yellow. Now, I know you're thinking, color yellow? What does that have to do with anything? The color yellow, for a Western audience, the color yellow in food means something very important. It means wholesomeness. It means goodness. In much the same way that green, when we think of green leafy vegetables, means freshness. We are a culture of amber waves of grain. We are later a culture of golden corn. Yellow means something to us. Think about it like this. You go to the grocery store and you're buying a chicken. We all look for yellow-skinned chicken, right? They even have a brand called Golden Plump. Now, what happens if you go to Asia? Do you know one of the most popular types of chicken that they have in Asia? Black-skinned chicken. That, for most Western audiences, you turn your nose up at that. You like the golden aspect of it. Another example, butter. We love the golden quality of butter. A lot of farmers will feed their cows extra grass in order to get that golden color, which kind of is a problem when we get to margarine, which in its natural state is white. So we have to tint it yellow in order for people to like it. So don't discount the, the, the motivation of yellow. And I think that's what the nuns unconsciously dug into, and that's why the trend continued. So what I want to explain to you is the pattern. The pattern that I see is there first was this motivation this motivation for yellow. And then what I'm starting to see as time moves on, as the history moves on, are these signposts, technological, cultural signposts that start to happen as the pastries were developed, as they spread throughout the world, and even today, into the future for that time, you start to see egg yolk looking rich pastries throughout the continent and throughout the world. So what I wanna do is I wanna use this pattern recognition to kind of show you what I can see in the future. Look for the yellow, the motivation that exists within cultures, to see into the future. I'm just gonna show you three. There are thousands, of course, available. But I just wanna show you three, three that I think you'll find interesting. So the first one I wanna to talk to you about is something that I'm gonna call sensory suspension. And this is based on the cultural motivation, the yellow, if you wanna call it that, that Americans have about controlling time. We, as Americans, love to control time. For Americans, time is something to be on, to be kept, to be lost, to be gained, to be made the most of, and sometimes to be killed. So in a sense, time is a physical thing that we think we can control. And we think that we can control it so much that we can parse it out and use it when we want it. The first signpost, the first aspect of this motivation I see coming up in culture is the freezer. Because if you think about it, what is a freezer but a way to store time? You no longer did we have to be in the location or in the season in order to enjoy something. We could lock it up and enjoy it when we wanted, controlling time. More recent example, how many of you have a TiVo? What is that but a freezer for your desperate housewives, right? <laughs> Right? That's what it is. I, no longer, Mr. Cable Guy, am I going to be behoven to you. When I want to watch a show, I'll watch a show. I can control time, right? More recent, have you guys have all heard that no one's talking on the phone anymore, right? I don't want to, be, I don't want to answer the phone when you call me and your time. I'm going, to, I'm going to tweet you. I'm going to email you on my time. So you can see how this, this motivation gets extended out. Now, where would it go in the future? Imagine that you sit down to dinner and uh, you're going to enjoy this classical meal of mashed potatoes, meatloaf, and green beans. And you're called away. And now imagine 10 minutes, half hour, hour, a day later that you could come back to this meal 
and you could enjoy it, and it wouldn't have changed. The idea that we could have technology that could pause it. The idea that the meatloaf wouldn't be dry, the mashed potatoes wouldn't be gluey, and the green beans wouldn't be army yellow. I don't even know if this technology exists, but I would say that we probably would want this technology as a culture based on our motivations. Another one that I see is, po is possible, ultra scratch is what I'm calling it. Now, the motivation that I see embedded in this is Americans' idea that we can control risk, okay? For, uh, you know, for centuries, we have been obsessed with this idea of risk control. At first, it was about uh, things we could see, debris and dirt that we could see. And as we've developed, we started to be uh, trying to control the risk of things we couldn't see, pesticides, genetic modification, things like that. You start to see the signpost of this in our culture in things as simple as bread, Wonder Bread. What is Wonder Bread? Why was Wonder Bread invented like it was? Why was it pure white? It was pure white because we wanted to make sure it didn't have any debris in there, really, because before that time, people were worried about what was being put into their bread. And why was it wrapped in plastic, in a plastic bag? Because we were worried about outside contaminants getting into it. I wanted the safest bread possible. Now, that was in the past. As we've matured as a culture, and we've decided we want to control even more risk, we have uh, changed our idea of who we can actually trust now with our risk in our society. A lot of people have gotten to the point now that the only people they feel they can trust is themselves, and that the only types of food that they can trust are things that they know exactly where they came from. So the rise of farmer's markets, the rise of local, organic, things like that. So the problem with that, though, is we have this type of food that we actually feel that we can trust, but for a lot of people, a lot of Americans, they don't know how to cook foods that come from the raw source. So you see things like this. Services like Let's Dish popping up. You guys are all familiar, I think, with Let's Dish. This idea that I can start with basically semi-raw ingredients and I can turn them into something that I enjoy. Now, push it even a little bit further and say uh, that next signpost that I'm starting to see, 3D printing. Have you guys heard of 3D printing? Right now, it's only being used majorly uh, by the plastic industry. You take a resin, a plastic liquid resin, and they inject it. Within minutes, they can produce a 3D sculpture, a 3D item. There's already being work done throughout this country uh, to do this with food, to take not a plastic, but a batter, and to be able to turn it into a 3D piece of food. So you can imagine where I'm going to go with this. In the future, imagine that you wake up in the morning, and you go down for breakfast, and you don't go in your pantry, you go into your wheat bin, and you scoop out wheat, and you put it into, or oats, or whatever, and you put it into a device on top of your counter, and out comes fresh cereal, fresh bread, fresh pastry, the line between consumer and producer, there isn't one. And I can now trust that wholeheartedly. I know exactly. I, I know where that wheat came from. I just made that. So you can see how that would go, into, go toward those cultural motivations. So there again, I am again playing on the same issues. The idea that there was this motivation and that we see these signposts go, and then I can see the future. Last one I want to share with you is something I call continuous coaching. And this is based on the cultural motivation that I see in America that we want to control our health. We are obsessed with controlling our health. 200 years ago, physicians controlled our health. Okay? If you went in and you um, had a symptom, the physician, they took care of it. They, they gave you medicine and it helped that uh, symptom and you went home and you were fine. But what happened as medical technology advanced, we started to find out, you know what? Those symptoms, that's not the disease. The disease is much bigger. It's much more systemic. What causes that disease? Lifestyle. Now, physicians could not be in charge of your lifestyle, right? The idea that you, uh, you don't exercise, you have a dangerous job, you eat too much or uh, smoke, whatever it may be, right? Who's in charge of that? Us, right? So we became in charge of our own health. So you start to see signposts of things like this, taking your own blood. Think about that. A hundred years ago, our ancestors wouldn't even understand the idea that we had to take our own blood and take our own measurements. That's a doctor's job, not anymore. It's 
It's our job. So you, you starting to see how this is starting to manifest itself. Another example, airborne. You guys familiar with this? A proactive supplement that you take to help you so you don't get sick. There again, it sounds to me like a doctor. It's because the motivation is there in our society that we want to maintain our own health. And further on, have you guys seen these? This is called a Fitbit. Some of you I know are wearing this in this audience right now. This is a device that you wear on your person, that you download onto this all of your medical uh, information, like your basic me metabolic information, and it measures your footsteps, it measures your sleep pattern, and you can track it online. You can actually track it against other people. So you can see where this is going. Imagine that you go to a restaurant in the future, and you sit down, you open it up, and you say, am I going to have the cheeseburger or am I going to have the salmon? Well, I am going to predict that you're going to have a device in your pocket, probably part of your smartphone, and that device will not so much have you have downloaded all your information, it will be measuring on a second by second, breath by breath, your entire metabolic system. And it'll help you make this choice. Now, what's really interesting is after you've eaten it, you can refer back to it, and it'll say something like, you have now reduced your risk for getting Alzheimer's by 0.01%. <laughs> that could happen. That is where that motivation is going. That is where I am seeing this pattern from motivation through the signpost. That's why and how I'm seeing the future. I've just shared with you three potential futures. And hopefully you see that I've also shared with you a tool, a very powerful tool. Now, I spend all of my day thinking about the future of food, and I'm guessing that you do not. But you do think about the future of your business, your organization, your community. And what I'm saying is that this tool could help you. Look for the underlying motivation within your culture and then look for how it's manifesting itself in particular signposts. And if you can see those, you can see the future. Mark Twain said something, my favorite, one of my favorite Americans said something, and he said, history doesn't repeat itself, but sometimes it rhymes. I love that quote, probably because I see it through my own vantage point, but I think he saw the pattern. And hopefully, now you do too.